Welcome to this lecture. This is your lecturer, Dr. Susan Macharia from Mount Kenya University. Uh, the course is BEP 3201, The Psychology of Teaching and Learning. And this is a course that is intended for any student who is taking the bachelor's program in education. Now, today, uh, we are going to cover four things. The first one, I want us to be able to describe the information processing model. We'll also be able to see something about the theories that help us to explain uh, forgetting among the students. We'll also be able to come up with six, at least six different ways of fostering uh, remembering among the learners so long as the content they learn is actually retained and used effectively for problem solving. And also we'll be able to see what is it that the teacher can do to enhance lesson delivery for effective teaching. Now, the first part of the lecture talks about the information processing. And we need to, to be conversant with how we process the information. When the teacher is in the class, we are delivering content. And when we deliver content, we have to have a rough idea about how that content enters the mind of the learner and can be used, uh, to, uh, can be retrieved for problem solving and effective learning. Uh, we have a model there that explains how the memory takes place. From the environment, we have so many messages that come in the terms in terms of stimuli stimuli can be picked from the senses so you can see here we have the incoming information that is coming in uh, in form of the stimuli they can be picked by any senses in any of us uh, five, five senses sense of hearing sense of sight taste and all now, this, sensor, this um, first box here is what we call the sensory memory. Sometimes it is called the sensory register. Now, if that, all those messages are attended to, they move to the next uh, section. That is the short-term memory, after which they are processed into the long-term memory, which you have the brain. Looking at this uh, model, you can see that this arrow going down shows the information is lost back to the environment. When it comes here, there's another arrow going down showing that the information again is lost back to the environment, which also means it is forgotten. When it comes to the long-term memory, you can see another arrow going down which means, once again, the messages or the information stored in the long-term memory in our brain is lost back to the environment. Now, uh, in the sensory memory, that means where all the messages converge from the environment, any messages we receive through the sense of hearing, sense of sight, taste, sounds, anything, it can only be there up to maximum of half a second. Thereafter, if it is not attended to, it is lost to the environment. If it is attended to, it goes now to the short-term memory, that was the second box, which has a capacity of between five to nine items, uh, which was advanced by a psychologist by the name of George Miller, around 1956. When you talk of the information being processed, it can be done through different ways, but the main one is what we call rehearsal. There's a maintenance rehearsal, which is done uh, within the short-term memory, and then uh, the elaborative rehearsal simply means that we link these new messages that we are receiving from the environment with what we already know that is in our memory. Now, 
any information that goes to their short-term memory stays there for about 18 to 20 seconds. Thereafter, it is lost if it is not processed further. Now, in terms of uh, forgetting, I've already pointed out different ways in which the information is being lost to the environment. And uh, the first way in which we forget, we are going to see what we call the cataloging errors, filing or retrieval errors. Now, what are these? Now, once the message has uh, been uh, stored in the long-term memory, it is not just lumped up. It is presented in a file, which we call a folder, similar to how a computer works. Now, inside that memory, we have subcomputers, I mean sub-files, which organize information. This information is now put there as an electronic signal ready for retrieval as need arises. So when you talk of cataloging errors, simply means that the message or that information is put in the long file. It is just like using your mobile phone. So when you are using the mobile phone, you can save somebody's contact uh, in, a form, in a folder that does, you, can't, you, know, you can't be able to remember how you saved it. And therefore, when you want to send money or when you want to send a message, you simply cannot remember, how did I save my friend? Did I save this person as Dr. So-and-so? Did I save it as a, 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 any, any name? So when you search, you can't know. So that's what you call about the cataloging errors. Now, in terms of uh, retrieval, sometimes we are under pressure, especially during an exam situation, to retrieve information for us to be able to answer questions in the exam. Now, because the body is tense, when you look at the question paper, uh, you, you send an electronic signal to the brain to retrieve the messages for you, the information that you saved, relevant to that question, and then you can begin solving the question. Now, because of the tension, this electronic signal is not able to reach uh, the brain, the particular file, where the information is, and that means the electronic signal comes back with nothing. Hence, that is what we, well, that is what we call retrieval failure. Another psychologist, uh, who is called uh, Jock and Jock, 1992, talked about disuse as a way to help us remember what, you know, uh, how uh, to account for how forgetting takes place. And this one simply means he talks of disuse. Now, disuse means that we save the information in our brain, but because we don't practice and use it in problem solving over and over, this information is taken further and further down the folder and it's not that it is lost but because of disuse it is going down 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 the folder it is like having uh, looking at your wardrobe or where you keep your clothes whenever you have a new dress or a new uh, uh, shirt you like wearing it over and over but when it begins getting old you throw it in your box or in your wardrobe and then in due time it um, you forget that you had it so it goes down 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 you only keep the fresh clothes uh, on top of your box there so when it comes to this uh, disuse it simply means that the information that we already saved in our brain is not uh, actually used and therefore it goes down the folder now the other one is what we call the trace theory or trace, uh, the decay theory. This one simply means that any information that we have in our brain simply gets, fades away with time if it is not used. And you can see from this uh, curve, on this side, we have the, the, the percentage of how much is remembered. And on the horizontal axis, we have the passage of time. When the information is fresh, 
the so many so much of it can be remembered because as you can see it's approaching 100 percent but as we go down with time 10 minutes 20 30 one year one month going that way that information is lost and that's what we call the trace theory now another theory that can help us account for this phenomenon of forgetting is what we call the interference model now as the word suggests when we interfere it is like uh, the information that we receive is being is uh, being uh, messed up along the way and this interference can be explained in two ways the first one is what we call the proactive interference model now this this one simply means that whatever we had learned previously interferes or hinders the ability to remember that which we have learned uh, recently and most of the times we find that our the, the things that we forget through this model is what is learned during similar circumstances similar things they mess they interfere with each other it's like we confuse and therefore uh, that's what we call the proactive interference model the second part here is what we call the retroactive interference now retroactive as the word suggests simply means that we we lose information we forget information because what we have learned recently interferes with what we had learned way earlier and therefore uh, this this information that is being interfered with basically gets lost and therefore in an exam situation the student or even the, that particular person who is trying to solve a question cannot remember what uh, was done the other one is actually the decay model and decay model simply means that the information that we are uh, teaching by way of content simply just is lost back to the environment before being processed into the brain and if i can take you back allow me just to take you back to the model now you can see in the sensory memory we have the decay at that level in the short-term memory any information that is not transferred into the long-term memory right here is lost back to the environment through the process process of decaying any information that goes into the long-term memory but is not used decays again so decay really takes place at three stages uh, and we have we have to have a rough idea of what we can do uh, to enhance now remembering now class let's look at the third thing that I wanted to pro that, that I wanted to uh, to present to you is now we have said so much about remembering so how do we remember I mean so much about forgetting so how do we remember now the first thing many teachers have always asked themselves I did so much but when my students perform uh, when I give an examination in a, in a, uh, I give them an examination, they perform poorly. Sometimes when I go to the classroom and I ask them what we, 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 we talked about last time, clearly they have lost it. And therefore, we are going to look at now how we can enhance what we call remembering. The first way, we use what we call mnemonic devices. Mnemonic devices. So mnemonic devices are basically short forms, short forms that we can use uh, for us to be able to remember, to give us a cue or a tip of how, of, of everything that we need to remember. For example, in mathematics, when you are learning about the trigonometric ratios, we know the, the ratios of sine, cosine, tangent 
uh, in uh, chemistry, you can be thinking about the first 20 elements in the periodic table. And therefore, you make a small word that will help you to remember the order. You can even talk about the order of reactivity in chemistry. Uh, but for the purpose of this lesson, I've chosen two uh, mnemonics. One generated from mathematics, another one generated from English. So, um, now let's imagine you are teaching your students the order of operations. Where we start with brackets, followed by, <coughs> you know, that entire sequence. Brackets first. As the teacher taught you, brackets first. I'm also teaching you the same, brackets first. So when we have P, P simply means a bracket. It's called parenthesis. So if you are helping your students to learn the order of operations, teach them this word, PEMDAS. What is PEMDAS? PEMDAS, simply you can, you can, you can use a word or a small phrase to help you remember that order of operations. Thus, please excuse my dear Auntie Susan. Uh, sometimes we are teaching conjunctions. Conjunctions are joining words in English. Uh, and the students want to be able to remember all of them very fast and to be able to apply them as need arises in a sentence. So, you can also uh, use fanboys. F means for, and, no, you know, by, yet, all that. So, when you just have that one word, it, you know, it summarizes all of them together. And the students will be able to, uh, to, to have all of them and, uh, you know, choose whichever applies in a sentence as need appear, uh, arises. In mathematics, again, Sometimes we teach uh, trigonometry, and in trigonometry uh, we have the sine ratio, the cosine ratio, the tangent ratio, and our teacher uh, ably taught us something about Sokatoa. It is the same as, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's also another mnemonic, because sine will be opposite over uh, hypotenuse, and the rest will follow. Now, sometimes as a teacher of chemistry, you may want to help your students remember the first 20 elements in the periodic table, or sometimes the reactivity series. So we just have uh, an acronym that will suit, and it will help them remember very fast and apply. So even if you're asking them which is more reactive, sodium or calcium, they'll be able to use that, uh, uh, the mnemonic device, and give you the answer within no time. Now, let's go to the next strategy, this one, overlearning. What is overlearning? Now, overlearning simply means uh, that whatever has been uh, learned in class, we apply it in different situations until that concept enters our brain. Like, uh, you remember the time when you were learning the, how to add way, way back in uh, class one or when you were too young. We wanted to learn how to add. So every time that you, 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 you check, uh, you, you maybe went to the shop, you wanted to know how much was spent to buy items, sugar, maize flour, you know, whatever. So you'd always ask your mother or whoever is with you just to find out what is the total. Did the shopkeeper get the same amount that you paid? So you take the receipt and say how much is sugar, you add, you add, and see, you compare with what was actually paid. That is a bit of overlearning. Therefore, in the classroom, overlearning can be done differently. Sometimes the student can do, or you know, self-quizzing. You set a test for yourself based on what the teacher taught you, covering different concepts, and then you do that test and you mark for yourself. Whatever you didn't get, then you can read again and read and read until you are in. The other one is this distributed practice. What is distributed practice? It is practice done over a period of time. Um, the other one is practice itself now. 
this one is a strategy, the practice. And as you know, they say, practice makes perfect. Now here, I want us to review that practice and say, perfect practice makes perfect. And therefore, any time that you are uh, learning something, practice over and over and over and over until you get it. The other one is elaborative rehearsal. This is strategy number four. Elaborative rehearsal simply means that when we are, whenever we are learning, we need to make sure that we connect new information with what is already in our brain. And that is what we, 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 we see. Uh, so it's also, it's also good for us teachers uh, to, to try to help the students see the connection between what you taught last time what you are teaching now and how they merge. That's what we are calling elaborative rehearsal. Mm -hmm. Now let's go to number five. Sleep mm -hmm. and rest. So now sleeping means that uh, we get the brain to relax. And all the messages that we are supposed to load into the brain actually get an opportunity to sink in. Therefore, a good night's rest is very important so that you are able now to give the brain an opportunity uh, to do all that and when we are talking about the in the messages to sync we are talking about consolidation of information then uh, another one we are supposed to use you know just like eating you cannot, let's say you go to a place and you want to eat something, or even bread. You don't take the entire bread and stuff the, everything into your mouth. So, this strategy to help us remember is what you are calling part learning or chunking. Simply means we break down the material that we want to, to teach and uh, remember into small meaningful pieces small meaningful bits and then we present bit by bit that is what we are calling the chunking or part learning for example if you wanted to remember somebody's mobile number maybe you met an old friend they told you my number is zero seven what 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 then you say i didn't get it can you give me that number in digits digits of small bits of two so zero seven two two nine three four four eight eight that way the person remembers but if you give the entire number as a block they can't get it and that's why we are calling now the path learning breaking down the learning to be the material to be learned into small manageable bits now another technique relaxation what is relaxation basically freeing the brain the body and muscles of tension and therefore you can apply the, 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 the technique of relaxation by breathing in deeply hold that breath as much as you need and then from there you is you can do that technique for about 10 minutes and everything uh, relaxes now the last bit of my uh, lecture is going to see now how teachers can be able to apply all this information for effective teaching and learning. Now, the first strategy, because we want our students to, to get the information, we want them to remember, we want them to excel in examinations. Now, the first strategy. We know that information is picked from the environment through the senses and therefore the first strategy that is so so key is to make sure that we stimulate multiple senses during lesson delivery so whatever you talk you are you are you are verbal communication you are resources that are visual they can do something they can be writing notes whatever or something a keyword or something Whatever they see, hear, do, 
is the same thing. It's like you are sending that message using the five senses together. So the student cannot go wrong. Next one. The teacher can think about presenting the content in small manageable steps. And this one is supposed also to be done as we prepare our lesson. The other one, number three, learning is supposed to be active. I see, I hear, I forget, I see, I remember, I do, I understand. And therefore, these learning activities will be very important because they will help the learner perform an activity as they learn. Then, at the same time, it helps them uh, do elaborative rehearsal. It will link them with what they have already done. Number three, the learner can be helped to create some tips to help him or her remember. And these are the tips we called mnemonic devices. Four, create a conducive environment in the classroom. Create a conducive environment in the classroom and avoid distraction. So that conducive environment should be free of noise and any other thing that will uh, send conflicting messages in the classroom and therefore the students can learn. Then, give periodic revision. What is periodic revision? You can give cuts, you can give assignments, give uh, rats, that is random assessment tests, so that every, all the content can be brought to the surface of the brain and they can use it. Then, here, you can use practice uh, with the content that has been learned by way of classwork and homework. They can also uh, do the same in groups and it will be fine. Uh, now, last thing. What are your take-home points? Let's look at your take-home points. Now, we have learned about the information processing model as propounded by Atkinson and Schifrin around 1968. Have it at your fingertips. The next thing, we have learned about forgetting. So, when we learn about forgetting, five ways or at least six that you should help you to know how we forget. Next, we have learned about the strategies that uh, we use to enhance memory. And then lastly, we have seen uh, what the teacher can do in the classroom to enhance learning. And because a teacher never goes home without an assignment, the assignment is here. Now, one, there are two questions. Now, look at the factors that contribute to forgetting of learned content in your subject area. And then, number two, in your area of specialization, can you make sure that you develop 10 mnemonic devices that you can share with your students as you begin your teaching career? Thank you so much. That was my lesson, Psychology of Teaching and Learning. Thank you. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then, email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.